It seems like everybody is talking about money these days. Can't seem to get along with it, and you certainly can't get along without it. Well, Pastor Cox is going to be talking about money tonight in his presentation entitled, A Financial Secret Most of the World Doesn't Know. But let me put your fears at ease. I promise no strong appeals will be made for you to send money to Pastor Cox. Actually, he's going to share some principles given in Scripture about our relationship with money. Jesus had more to say about man's possessions on this earth than probably any other subject, especially in relation to his kingdom and how you and I are to deal with the possessions we have. I know you'll enjoy tonight's presentation, plus gain important financial information as you learn a financial secret most of the world doesn't know. I'm happy to welcome each of you again this evening. Tonight, we're taking a look at the subject of financial secret that most of the world doesn't know. What we're going to do is just simply look at the Scripture and see what it has to say about finances and how you and I are to relate to finances. You remember, Jesus either told stories or he told about individuals who lives had been affected by the finances. And you remember, he told the story about the prodigal son. He said that this prodigal son went to his father and asked for his inheritance, went off and lived it up in riotous living. You also remember that as you read the Scripture, it talked about the woman that had been brought to Christ, caught in the act of adultery. You find a lot of different things that people came to Christ about sins that they were having trouble with. You remember it also talked about the thief on the cross, and evidently he was a thief. You remember when he was down in the city of Jericho, and he came out, he came upon a man by the name of Zacchaeus. And so you find that a lot of people have come to Christ with different problems. But you know there's one problem that I can't find any place in Scripture where anybody ever came to Jesus and said, this is my problem. In fact, all the years that I've been in the ministry, I've never had an individual come to me and say, this is my problem. I've had people come to me with all kinds of problems. I've had people come and say, I've stole something. I've had people come and say, Brother Cox, I've committed adultery. I've had people come and say that I've got a terrible problem with alcohol. Had others come and say, I've got a problem with drugs. I've had people come with all kinds of problems, but there's one problem that no one has ever come and said, this is my problem, and I can't find any place in Scripture where anybody ever went to Christ and said, that's my problem. And yet Jesus talks very clearly about it. Listen to what he says. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses. I have never had anybody ever come to me and say, You know what my problem is? I'm a miser. I want to get my hands on all the money I can get my hands on. That's my problem. I've never had anybody ever do that. And I never can't find in Scripture where anybody ever went to Christ and said, That's my problem. And Jesus said, watch out, be very careful of covetousness for a person's life does not consist of the things that he possesses. In fact, Jesus told a parable, told a parable about a farmer. This particular farmer evidently had had a very, very good year. Now, let me read one other text here before we go into that story. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, it says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So he said, you've got to watch out, you've got to be careful how you relate to money. Now, it doesn't say there that money is the root of all evil, but it says that the love of money. Now, Christ makes this real clear in this story with this, about this farmer. This is what he says. And he spoke a parable to them, saying the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. Evidently, he's had a very good year. I mean, it has rained just at the right time. The sun has shone. He's had a bumper crop. I mean, tremendous harvest. 
And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? He's got such a tremendous harvest that he's filled up all of his barns. He doesn't have room to put all of his crop in. And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I'll store all my crops and my goods. He said, that's what I'll do. He said, I'll tear down all these old barns. I'll build bigger barns, and I'll store all my crops. And some people say, that's his trouble. Shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have tore down those barns and built bigger ones. Shouldn't he have? Huh? Shouldn't he have? Well, I think that's a pretty good businessman. Choosing his head, he said, I'll just tear down these old barns, I'll build bigger ones, and I'll have a place to store my crop. And I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Ah, he said, I made it. I don't have to worry anymore. I've got enough to retire, to set back. Just relax, enjoy it, I've made it. You say, that's his trouble? Well, if it is, there's a bunch of you in trouble. No, that's not his trouble. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you then who will those things be which you have provided? Said, all these things that you've got, you're going to die. And then all these things you have, who's it going to belong to? And I've heard people say, that's the problem. No, it hadn't told you what his problem is yet. Hadn't made that clear. You've got to read the next verse. God tells you exactly what his problem is. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. There's the problem. Not anything wrong in having things. I can read to you text after text and story after story in the Bible about some very, very wonderful people, righteous men, that were very wealthy. That's not the problem. Covetousness is not necessarily a problem of the rich. Some people want to think that. That's not the case. You can be very poor and be covetous. It's not just a problem of the rich. It's a problem if you're not rich towards God. You need to be rich towards God. That's what he's trying to get across. See, that's what's necessary. And he's trying to help us be rich towards God. You see, some people give, and some people give to the Lord because they think the Lord needs it. You ever thought that? You know, you give your offering because you think God needs it. God doesn't need your offering. He doesn't need your offering at all. This is what it says. For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. God said, every beast out here, every cow, every horse, every animal, he said, it all belongs to me. He doesn't need your money. Doesn't need your money at all. In fact, God said, if I needed it, I wouldn't tell you. He goes on and says this. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. So he doesn't need your money. He's not hurting. That's not the reason God asked you and I to give. Do you know why he asked us to give? Huh? To be careful so we don't become covetous. That's why you need to give. You need to give for your own good. You need to give so you don't become covetous. There was a great preacher of the past by the name of Henry Ward Beecher. Did you ever hear of Henry Ward Beecher? Henry Ward Beecher was a minister, a young minister, out in the country, and he received an invitation to pastor the church in Cincinnati. He went there to speak so the board of deacons or whatever it was could look him over, 
And when he got there, he found that this church, they had invited him to come and to preach at to see if he wanted to pastor and see if they wanted him to, was a great, great, big new church. I mean, it was huge. He couldn't believe it. And he preached, and after it was over, they invited him to come and to pastor the church there. And man, as a young pastor, he was thrilled. Went there to pastor the church, hadn't been there very long until he found out that that church was terribly in debt. I mean terribly in debt. So it wasn't too long until he got a letter from the bank saying, Pastor Beecher, your church is behind on its payments to the bank and you're going to have to do something or we will have to foreclose. So Pastor Beecher went around and visited all the church members, told them that they needed to make the payments for the bank and... Uh, they just didn't have enough money, and some of the church members said, well, we'll give a little. And some said, oh, we'll think about it. And some said, ah, oh, we can't give anything. And a little while passed, and the bank called him up again and said, Pastor Beecher, uh, your note's due, and you're not making your payments. And Pastor Beecher went out and visited them all again and got the same response. Some of them said, oh, we'll give a little, and some said, oh, we'll think about it, and some said we can't. Just wasn't enough money coming in. And the bank sent him a notice and said, Pastor Beecher, we're going to have to foreclose. And he called a meeting of all the church members, and they gathered there in the church, and Pastor Beecher laid it all out in front of them and said, we're just not getting enough money here to meet the payments. And the bank's going to foreclose if we don't. And everybody just sat there like a bump on a log. And finally, Pastor Beecher said, well, let's have the benediction and we'll go home. And I'll notify the bank to go ahead and foreclose. And an old man stood up in the back and he said, Pastor Beecher, Pastor Beecher, we don't want to lose our church. We don't want to lose our church at all. I'll give the money to pay off the bank. And everybody sighed a great big sigh of relief. And the old man said, at 10%. And Pastor Beecher said, sir, when you die, I'd like to write your epitaph. And this is what I'd write. Here lies old 10%. The more he got, the less he spent. The less he spent, the more he craved. If he gets to heaven, we'll all be saved. Very, very true. See, the problem that you and I have is a problem of covetousness. God said, watch out, be careful. Don't become covetous. And God has given some very simple things to keep you and I from becoming covetous. Listen to what he says here. Will a man rob God? It's a good question. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, how have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. It's a good question. Would you rob God? He asked it. He said, how have we robbed thee? And he said, oh, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. I had a friend that was preaching on this subject one night, and uh, after he had preached on it, this fellow came up, and he said, listen, you don't have to give any tithe to be saved. And my friend said, how did you arrive at that? And he said, the thief on the cross. He said, he never gave any tithe and he's going to be saved. So he said, you don't have to give any tithe to be saved. And my friend said, you're right. He said, that's right. He said, there's only one difference between you and the thief on the cross. And the fellow said, what's that? And he said, he was a dying thief and you're a living one. <laughs> quite, quite a bit of difference, you see, when you take a look at it. God said, would a man rob me? He said, you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. Now, he tells us some very clear things about the tithe. You'll find that it is clearly instructed in the Old Testament. Genesis 14, verse 18, it says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was a priest of the Most High God. And blessed be the Most High God who hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Now he's talking, Melchizedek is talking to Abraham. 
And he's telling Abraham that God blessed him. He delivered his enemies into his hand. And it says, and he, that means Abraham, gave him tithes of all. It says that Abraham paid to Melchizedek tithe of everything that he had been given. Do you remember a man in the Bible by the name of Jacob? Huh? Well, you remember that Jacob had deceived his father, his brother, had stowed the birthright. Do you remember that? And Esau's so mad at him that he's decided to kill him. And Jacob's mother, Rebekah, has told him to flee. So he's fleeing. He's run because he thinks Esau's after him. And he's run clear out to the plains of Bethel and he's tired and he's laid down there and gone to sleep and during the night he sees these angels coming and going on this ladder. Next morning when he woke up, he said, this is the place of God. And he said, this stone, he had used a stone for a pillow, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give a tenth to thee. He said, Lord, whatever you give me, I'm going to give a tenth to thee. Okay? I want you to remember that. Remember it very carefully. Because he gets down to his Uncle Laban's house, and Uncle Laban has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. Rachel is beautiful. Leah is ugly. And as it usually goes, Jacob fell in love with Rachel. Went to her father and said, what would I have to do to have the hand of your daughter? And the old man said, oh, not much. You'd have to work for me for seven years. I don't know how many weddings we'd have on that basis today, but... Nevertheless, uh, Jacob said, okay. So he works for Laban for seven years. In the end of seven years, he says, I have fulfilled my part of the bargain. I'd like to have your daughter's hand. And Laban says, fine. And they have the wedding. And over there, you know, they wear veils. And when the wedding is over and he gets his bride home, lo and behold, he has Leah, not Rachel. And he said, I didn't work seven years for you. And he takes her by the arm and took her back to her father. And he said, this isn't our bargain. This is what we said. He said, I worked seven years for Rachel. And he said, I'm sorry, it's a custom here. He said, the older daughter has to marry first. He said, I'll tell you what, work for me for seven more years and I'll give you Rachel also. I really don't know that that was a bargain. But he said, okay. And he works for him for seven more years. So at the end of two years, his pay for four, excuse me, at the end of 14 years, his pay is two women <laughs> to support and to care for. All right. And Laban calls him in and says, listen, I guess if you're going to stay here, uh, we ought to arrive at some kind of agreement for his pay. And Jacob says, fine. And Laban says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you all the plain cattle, all the plain calves that are born, all the plain sheep, uh, excuse me, sorry, all the spotted ones I'm going to give to you, all the spotted ones I'll give to you, and I'm going to keep the plain ones. He said, all the solid colored ones, I'll keep all the spotted ones you can have. And Jacob said, fine. Now, that's really a good deal since all of Laban's cattle or black angus there's not a spotted one in the bunch not a spotted one among all the cattle not a spotted one among all the sheep not a spotted one among all the goats there are no spotted ones in his cattle and the Lord said to Jacob he said Jacob he said you see that cane over there he said I want you to cut that cane down and I want you to put it in every place that the cattle drink I want you to put it in the drinking troughs I want you to put it in the pond I want you to put it in the creek every place that the cattle drink I want you to put that cane so Jacob said okay Lord and went out and cut it down put it in the drinking troughs and the ponds and the creek and lo and behold that spring when the cattle started calving they were spotted and Laban said what's going on here 
said, this can't be. Fence must be broke or something. Won't happen next year. But next year they were spotted. And Laban called Jacob in and he said, I'll tell you what, Jacob. He said, I've thought this thing over. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take all the spotted ones and I'm going to give you all the plain. And Jacob said, all right. And the Lord said, Jacob, get that stuff out of the water. You can read it. I mean, that's what it talks about right there. Later when he was talking to his wife, Rachel, this is what Jacob said to her. Listen. Your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God allowed him not to hurt me. And let me tell you, when he was changing his wages, he was trying to lower it. He wasn't trying to raise it. And when Jacob left Laban's house, house he was an extremely wealthy man. Why? Because he said, Lord, whatever you give me, I'll give a tenth unto you. Promised that he would do that. Said, I'll return that to you, Lord. And he was faithful in it. It says, all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's, it is what? Holy unto the Lord. Now, please understand, I may say give and I might say pay, but really you don't give tithe and you don't pay tithe. Get it clear in your head. You return tithe. It doesn't belong to you to begin with. It's the Lord's. Doesn't belong to you, so all you can do is return the tithe. You cannot give it because it's not yours. You can't pay it because it's not yours. It's the Lord's. And all you can do is simply return it because it's holy. It belongs to Him. Now, you'll find that the tithe as the Scripture talks about it, is also taught in the New Testament. In fact, Paul, in the book of Hebrews, picks up this story about Melchizedek and Abraham, and this is what he says. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a what? A tenth part of all first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, that is, the king of peace. So he says here, he uses that illustration showing that you and I are to return our tithe. And in the book of Hebrews, he comes right on down and he says this. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they have come out of the body of Abraham. So Paul, uh, Peter, excuse me, Paul is saying, this is what we are to do. And even when Jesus was here, he told us we were to return our tithe. Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Now, when he says that they paid tithe of mint, anise, cumin, those are spices. That was the smallest means of exchange that they had in Jesus' day. And he said these Pharisees were very meticulous about paying their tithe. He said, now you don't have any mercy and judgment or faith. And I can tell you right now, you can be very, very faithful in your tithe and it won't save you, okay? He's telling them, you need to have faith, you need to have mercy, you need to have judgment. That's necessary, he said. But you shouldn't leave the other what? Undone. Tells you and I that we are to return the tithes to the Lord. Now, let me say a little bit to you about the tithe, the purpose of the tithe. It tells us here in Nehemiah, and that we should bring the first fruits of our dough and our offering and the fruits of all manner of trees of wine and of oil unto the priest to the chambers of the house of our God and the tithes of our ground unto the Levites that the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of our tillage. 
the Levites, these were the priests, they did not receive an inheritance. All the tribes of Israel received a portion of land, not the Levites. They were to receive the tithe. This is how they were to be cared for, is by the tithe. Also today, the ministry is to be cared for by the tithe. Listen. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they have offered as a heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore, I have said unto them among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. God never intended for the ministry to be cared for by ways that I see it being cared for today. It's not to be paid for by bingo. It's not to be cared for by chicken suppers. It's not to be cared for by raffles or white elephant sales or cakewalks. Maybe y'all never heard of a cakewalk. But anyhow, those are not the way that God intended for the ministry to be cared for. It's to be cared for by the tithe. That's what he's talking about. God set that up. And dear friend, we're going to look at it in just a moment. And God knew what he was doing when he set it up. He saves a great lot of trouble that many churches would learn today a lot if they would follow. Malachi 3, verse 10, it says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in mine house, and test me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now, God says that if you and I will return the tithe unto him, that he in turn will bless us. In fact, he says proving, that means trying. And I could spend the rest of the evening just telling you one story after another, how God will bless you. And when, I, when he says that he will bless you, let me get something real clear. He's not talking about a spiritual blessing. I run on to people read that text and say, oh, I know he'll bless me spiritually, Brother God. No, you read the next text after that, and it makes it very clear that he will bless you temporally. That's what he's talking about. Not just spiritually. He says, I'll keep the tree from casting its fruit ahead of time. It means that he will bless you financially if you'll return your tithe to him. I was holding a, little, a meeting in a place called Dumas, Texas. I don't know if you've ever heard of Dumas, Texas, but it's in the panhandle. And this little lady was coming, little old lady, and when I got to this subject on the tithe, when it was over, she came up to me and she said, Brother Cox, I can't give the Lord any tithe. And I said, how come? She said, all I have as a source of income is $14 a month. And she said, I babysit just to eke out an existence. And she said, every last penny's counted for, and I can't give any tithe to the Lord. You know, what are you going to say? You know, you're going to say, well, that's okay. Don't worry about it. You're going to say, well, you don't have to, you know. Who, who gave me the right to make such statements? God didn't. So I didn't know what to say. I just looked at her and said, I'm sorry, I didn't write the book. It's the only thing I knew to say. I said, I just didn't write the book. Well, the next night when she came back, you could see there wasn't any victory there. Her face was about that long. Next night, same way, but the third night she came back, she had a smile on her face and she said, Brother Cox, I'm going to give my tithe if I starve to death. And I said, I doubt that you'll starve. This woman lived in Dumas. Seventy miles from Dumas, Texas, is a town called Stratford, Texas. Her and her husband had lived in Stratford. They had raised their family in Stratford. Her husband had died. She had moved to Dumas, been there for quite a number of years. Her daughter still lived in Stratford. Now, folks, the very next day, very next day, her daughter called her up, said, Mother, the bank called me. Said they called me because Dad has money in the bank in Stratford 
and we didn't know about it and we'd never done anything about it and they called and asked me about it. She drove down and got her mother. They went to Stratford, went to the bank. They drew out enough money to take care of her the rest of her life. You won't convince me that God doesn't. I, he's done it so many times in my own life that I couldn't even start to tell you how many times he has honored it because, and by the way, let me make something real clear. Just because I'm a minister, that doesn't mean that I shouldn't pay or return tithe. Don't get that idea for a moment. God, I have just as much problem with covetous as anybody else does. Okay? So these preachers that always taken it and never given it, they're missing something, I'll tell you for sure. You know, they ought to learn to give a little. Might make a great lot of difference in their own spiritual experience. I hear a lot of them making pleas for money, but I don't see too many of them handing it out of their pocket. They might ought to try it. It makes a great, great difference. God says that if we will return it, that he will bless you, and dear friend, he will. Let's hurry on. It also says here that a tithe, okay, a tithe is a tenth. That's what it means. A tithe means a tenth. In other words, if I make a dollar, the tithe is ten cents. If I make ten dollars, it's one dollar. If I make a hundred dollars, it's ten dollars. And let me tell you a little secret. Nine-tenths will go farther than ten-tenths. Nine-tenths with God's blessing will go farther than ten-tenths without his blessing any day, any day. Much rather have ten-tenths in God's blessing than to have it all, any time. So it just simply says that we're to return the tithe on the increase. Let's say you have a business. Let's say for you to operate your business, it costs you $30,000. Let's say that you, from the operation of the business and all, you gross 60000 How much would you pay tithe on or return tithe on? 30000 That would be the increase. That's simply what it says. You're to return it on the increase. Now, it also says this. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in mine house, and test me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. He says that we're to bring the tithe to the storehouse. And I want to tell you tonight that I'm thankful that I belong to a church that has a storehouse. See, I'm thankful that I belong to a church that takes that serious. You take a church like this one, would you have any idea what the tithe paid by this church would be a year? Huh? Well, it mounts up probably about a million dollars. That's about what the tithe is. If the pastor was sticking that all in his pocket, he probably wouldn't be around. You see, God understood that. So he has a storehouse. And I'm thankful that I belong to a church that it doesn't make any difference if you're pastoring a church of 30, if you're pastoring a church of 300, if you're pastoring a church of 3,000, your salary's the same. I'm thankful for that. The pastor, Dan, here, his salary and mine are the same. No difference. What does that do? Well, that makes it possible for us to take some and help some little church that doesn't have enough. That also makes it possible to send people overseas as missionaries. It does things that God asks to be done. That's the advantage of having a storehouse. See, I know pastors that draw, oh, $100,000 a year, plus they have their house furnished, their car furnished, and an expense account. I have a little trouble with that especially when it's speaking of Christ and it says foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath no place to lay his head. I have a little trouble with that. If the minister's in it to make money, then he ought to get in some other line of work. 
That's not reason he needs to be here. You need to be here to preach the Word of God. My life, my soul, my interest, everything that I ought to do ought to be concentrated on taking the gospel to men and women. That's where it should be, and that's what God wants it to be. So it's nice to have a storehouse. That's a great, great blessing. Jesus was talking about the widow. You remember? He said, A certain poor widow came and threw in two mites which make a garden. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given into the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Sometimes when the offering plate is passed, I hear somebody will drop in a quarter and I'll hear the remark, oh, it's just the widow's mite. Let me tell you something. The widow's mite has nothing to do with how much you give. Not the least. It only has to do with how much you have left over. That's all. She put in all that she had. Great, great difference there. Also talks about a rich young ruler. Do you remember him? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. This young man had come to him and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? There's only one good. Now listen. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not fraud, defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these I have observed from my youth. And by the way, he's not lying. He's telling the truth. I mean, he said, I've done all this since I was a young person. Then Jesus looking at him, what? Loved him. And he said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. He said, Sell what you have. Come and be one of my disciples. Follow me. Walk with me. And he was sad at this word and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Now, I got to ask you a question tonight. You think Jesus was making it harder for that young man to get into heaven than anybody else? You think he just singled him out and said, Listen, I'm going to make it harder for you to get to heaven than anybody else? No. I can tell you right now, dear friends, if your possessions are standing between you and the Lord, you're lost. It's that simple. If your whole security is wrapped up in the things of this world, then enjoy it because it's all you're going to get. That's what he's saying. That young man, his whole life was his possessions. Wasn't willing to give it up. Went away grieved because he had great possessions. But lay up for yourselves treasure, where? In heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now he's telling you, lay up treasure where? In heaven. All right. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want to ask you, do you have anything laid up in heaven? A lot of you have savings accounts here on earth. Do you have a savings account up in heaven? Are you putting anything in it? Huh? Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be also. You better be putting something in that treasury. Saving account up there. That makes a great difference. Let's say that Kurt was to come to me and say, uh, 
how about going into business with me? And I'd say, Kurt, I can't go into business with you. And he'd say, oh, really, I'd like for you to go into business with me. Come on, go into business with me. And I'd say, uh, no, Kurt, I can't go into business with you. And Kurt said, really, I'd like for you to go into business with me. And I'd say, Kurt, I don't have any money. I don't have any capital. I can't put up anything to go in business with you. I just don't have anything to go in business with you. And say, well, I didn't ask you to put up anything. He said, I just want you to go in business with me. And I said, it's not fair. If I'm going to go into business with you, well, then I need to put up some capital. I need to be part of it. That's the only way I ought to go in business with you. And he said, no, I'm not asking you to do that. I just want you to go in business with me. And I'd say, but it's not fair. So that's okay, go into business with me. I'd say, okay, what kind of business do you want to go into? And he'd say, oh, let's put in a restaurant. I'd say, okay, we'll put in a restaurant. And so we sit down and we uh, draw up the plans on a real lovely restaurant. And we get the plans all made up and we say, man, that's great. And we have the restaurant built. And then we start and we hire us a cook that is absolutely fabulous. I mean, food that cook puts out is just almost beyond description. And we hire help, and we get in and we work in that restaurant, and we give the people the very best service we can give, and the clientele begins to build. And people come, and it, the restaurant goes along, and the end of the year comes... And Kurt calls me in the office one evening and he said, I've just been going over the books for the last year. And he said, I want to tell you that we have been able to pay our bills and we have cleared $20,000. I'd say, Kurt, you mean we've been able to pay our bills and clear $20,000? He said, yeah. I said, man, for the first year, that's fabulous. That's just almost unbelievable that we've been, in the first year, have been able to pay our bills and, and clear $20,000? He said, yeah, we have. And I said, man, that's great. And he said, I want to tell you how much I appreciate your work. He said, man, you have worked hard. You've worked long hours, way beyond the call of duty. And he said, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate it. And he said, I've just thought it over. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you 18 of that 20000 and I say, Kurt, you're sick. Something wrong with you. Now go give me 18 of that 20,000. He said, Yep, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you 18 out of that 20. And I'd say, Kurt, it's not right. You work just as much as I have, if not more. It's just not right. And he'd say, I know, but I want to give it to you. And he counts me out $18,000. I take that $18,000 and I go home and I tell Marita, I say, you know what? We just finished the first year of the restaurant and we have been able in that one year to pay all of our bills and clear $20,000. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. I said, better than that. Kurt just gave me 18 of that $20,000. And she said, he did what? And I said, he gave me 18 of that $20,000 and I just pull it out there and lay it out. And she said, is he okay? And I said, no, I don't think he is, but he gave it to me. And she said, well, you better put it up over there because he'll probably feel different tomorrow. And we go to bed. Man, I can't sleep. I just lay there and look at the ceiling. Finally, I get up. I go downstairs and I sit around there. Finally, I put on my clothes and get in the car and I drive down to the restaurant sat there at the desk in the office. And pretty soon I get up and I go over to the safe and I turn the dial on the safe, the combination, and I open the door and I look inside that and there lays Kurt's $2,000 in there. And I reach in there and I get Kurt's $2,000 and I stick it in my pocket and I say, now I got it all. That's exactly the way some people treat God. He gives them life. He gives them health. He gives them everything that they have. And they're not happy until they take his 10% and stick it in their pocket. 
Oh, dear friends, God just simply tells you and I that if we will return to Him, what He rightfully belongs to Him, what He owns, He owns it all, but He's just willing to say, I'll give it all to you, just return a tenth unto me. If we'll return that to Him, He says, listen, I'll bless you, I'll open the windows of heaven, I'll pour out a blessing on you that there won't be room enough to receive it. Dear friend, that book it stands there as absolute proof that he'll do exactly what he says if you and I will just return it to him. Listen, as Steve says, let's pray. Heavenly Father, tonight, so thankful that you're concerned about each one of us that the things that so often haunt our souls we can find victory in Christ Jesus bless each one here we pray that they may have riches treasures in heaven that they may look to thee and know that as they Seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added to them. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen.